Hello, this is Hasina Karbi, the founder of Impulse NGO Network and founder of Impulse Social Enterprises. Namaskar, dosto. Study IQ में आपका स्वागत है. आज हम आपको एक ऐसी सक्षियत से मिलाने वाले हैं, जिन्होंने human trafficking और livelihood के field में बहुत ही important काम किया है North East India पे. इनका नाम Hasina Karbi जी है, जिन्होंने Impulse Social NGO Network को found किया है और ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग को कंट्रोल करने के लिए एक एक बहुत ही इम्पोर्टेंट रोल प्ले किया है नॉर्थ ईस्ट इंडिया पे हसीना वेलकम टू द शो आप आप यू हैव प्लेड अ वेरी इम्पोर्टेंट रोल आप इन कंट्रोलिंग ट्रैफिकिंग इन नॉर्थ ईस्ट इंडिया इन वाया योर नॉन प्रॉफिट द इम्पल्स एंड यू नेटवर्क कुड़ी uh, I started very young, you know, Gaurav. I was 17 when I initiated uh, a non-profit organization. Uh, of course, at that point, uh, the jargon of non-profit or social entrepreneurship was not there. It was a very simple passion, and the passion that I was very actively involved in my school activities called the Leadership Training Services, that the formation of an alumni with my group of friends in school uh, got you know, the, I mean, the birth of Impulse NGO Network came about. Now, the work of Impulse NGO Network started off very much uh, in uh, Sinten village, which is in the East Khasi Hill district of Meghalaya, where it emphasized economic livelihood opportunity for women, who are basically uh, artists, crafts, uh, weavers, but they were very famous for bamboo and cane. Now, that used to be that adjacent village where my grandmother come from, from Light So Om. So my entry into the village was very natural and I was very welcome at a very young age. And the idea was that if we are able to emphasize a market platform which is consistent and enable the women to have a market for, you know, craft, there will be a transformation where young children would be educated. They don't have to really work. With that focus, uh, Impulse NGO Network was formed and it went into the journey of building the capacity of the local artisans, the skills, and creating market linkages, which I, I would say, I mean, over time it was a process that also engages from a very simple 30 numbers of artisans and grew over the years, not only in Meghalaya, but in the entire Northeast of India. But in, way back in 1989, when the Supreme Court of India banned forest resources, especially timber, most of the tribal population in the northeast of India, as well as in other parts of the country, was badly affected in the sense that their livelihood was the forest. And that was taken away and for environmental protection. And bamboo and cane was also clubbed as part of that order. And our artisans got badly affected because raw material was not available. And in the search of ensuring that their bamboo and cane should be termed as an agriculture product, Impulse took the next journey to intervene legally in addressing and reaching out to the court that bamboo and cane should be allowed to be used by the artisans because it's affecting the economy of the livelihood of the people. But most of the time, the legal justice delivery system in our country takes time. And we started witnessing a lot of migration that was taking place, which was a very natural migration where family would send the young children to work in the, in the cities, in the, in the town, in the state. They were going out, they started going missing. For us, that was an alarming question, what was going on, what was happening. And we understood that something was not right and some of them had no contact with the family. In the course of the mapping exercise assessment that was being done, we were also being connected to a larger ambit of other organizations in the country where we were invited to the Action Against Trafficking and Sexual Exploitation Conference. Um, and that was the way in 1999. So, you know, 89, 90, 91, we were working on all of this two things and our space of growth started you know, developing over time. And I was uh, introduced to a large group of senior organizations in the country who were already in the nonprofit sector, in the human rights sector, 
understanding and learning uh, the understanding of how human trafficking was taking place. So when I was sharing uh, our you know, experiences, uh, the complexities of the migration in the region, I was informed that that could be a form of human trafficking and we need to intervene. So the learning lesson and the takeaway from that conference was coming back home, uh, looking for a solution. And we were very young. So as young people, the enthusiasm is very high and the solution you know, needs to gradually grow. And we started a very small campaign called the email campaign to reach out at least to the organization that I met through the National Con I mean the you know, Southeast Asia Conference, in which I connected myself as an individual and the organization of who we are, what the role we are playing, and the kind of problem we are experiencing in people going missing and being taken out for work as cheap labor. And interestingly, in the course of you know um, a year, we got a reply from an organization in Mumbai, uh, Prerna, in which they got back to us and say two girls were rescued from Meghalaya who had been sent to work as domestic maid, but they were rescued from Kamatipura who were trafficked for sex trafficking. And along with that was another girl uh, from Tripura. So that opened up our eyes that the migration for domestic health, the migration that was happening for cheap labor was connected to people being vulnerable to human trafficking because of the effect of the economics. And that was the first step of how we should intervene. We opened up the doors that we should intervene, we should bring back the girls, because the whole framework at that point of time was that there has to be a human right approach to the intervention of cases, but it has to be within the framework of the law that the country allows in terms of protection of their rights. So that case led us into a journey of case to case, case to case, and understood the kind of exploitation that young girls and young, even young boys uh, from the Northeast, young women, were exploited because they were moving out for employment and they were duped and they were sold into human trafficking. And in the course over the years, the intervention, the case uh, processes that we undertook led us to the, you know, the understanding and realization that one single organization cannot work alone. It has to be collective. And that was a learning lesson that was very grounded. It was based on intervention of cases. And the impulse model was born, which is the innovation of the organization. Now, the innovation of the organization is the heart and soul of the organization today. It stands on 12 pillars, which is called the six P's and the six R's. Uh, the six P's is uh, partnership, prevention, protection, policing, and, policing press, and prosecution. Uh, the six R's is report, rescue, rehabilitation, repatriation, reintegration, and restitution. So it's a complete focus on a holistic intervention uh, that ensures that all the laws can be innovatively applied, that victims of human trafficking can actually get justice. So that is where the ball in the birth of impulse model came about, and our work in the anti-trafficking sector became uh, a forefront where we started engaging uh, partners organization across the northeast of India, coming together to focus on ending slavery, ensuring that it has to be collective, there has to be local leadership of non-profit organization so that we are able to engage the government to respond that this is a human right issue and India is signatory uh, to many uh, protocols and they are supposed to be protecting the rights of both women and children. So that's where the impulse model got formulated, uh, got structured, uh, got refined over the years, uh, got encouraged in terms of the practicality of the successes of the way we intervene with cases. Hasida, you have uh, you have scaled up into you know, impulse into a into a major non-profit uh, in, in the northeastern part of India and of course in other parts of India also. Uh, we have a lot of our viewers, our young professionals, you know, working in the social sector. Uh, what are your tips to them if one has to start and scale a social sector enterprise? The, the basic part is that a social sector enterprise has to have social outcome and social profits. It cannot be determined by financial profits at all. So one has to understand the value proposition out there that is just not about financial profits, but it's more of a social profit where we're looking at change that can take place and young professional contribution in today's world for a nonprofit, starting a nonprofit sector 
will also have to be linked with social issues which is affecting our community at large. And at the same time, it's also ensuring that each young person has an entrepreneurial journey because non-profit is just not about doing social work. It also has that entrepreneurial journey because you have to be creative, you have to be innovative, uh, you have to bring in resources together unless sustainability and scaling becomes a problem. Uh, you have worked in the trafficking sector you know, for some time uh, and you've also worked in the livelihood sector. What do you think, how are these two connected? And what are the multiplier effects of, of promoting and ensuring sustainable livelihood for women, you know, primarily in areas affected by migration and trafficking? So if you look at Impulse NGO Network, so as a non-profit organization after 26 years, uh, we realized that uh, in the last 12 years that most of the migration that was making women vulnerable, uh, children vulnerable, has a lot to do with employability, it has a lot to do with the economics of it. And looking at it from the context of the Northeast, the rich culture, heritage, the textile, the craft had no market value and that's where most people were moving out, especially from rural communities. I will not say that human trafficking is not affecting the urban communities. Today, the different forms of human trafficking online, you know, and even the young educated girls who are ap aspirational to move to Southeast Asia gets trafficked. There's a number of cases we're getting. But over and above, we, we realize from the data, from the cases that we have dealt over the years, that unless we strengthen economic livelihood, we are not giving women choices not to migrate because migration is a right. You cannot stop people from migration, but if choices of a better life in an ecosystem where there is not just about livelihood, but it's also food security around there where you have the ownership of your own culture, it's emphasized. The cultural heritage is being preserved. Then it has a more rich outcome uh, in terms of financial as well as social. So that is where the interconnect that Choices are very important element where economic play a very important role if we have to stop people from migration. And that is where Impulse Social Enterprise, the hybrid model or the sister concern of Impulse NGO Network was born, which is a private limited company. You have worked uh, very closely on promoting women's leadership also across multiple platforms. Uh, what do you think are the steps that you know the civil society, educational institutions, corporations and the government should take proactively to promote more women leadership uh, across organizations, be it the profit sector, be it the government, or be it the non-profit sector? I think from a woman perspective, uh, as a woman myself, I mean, my um, own personal experience, including the experiences of my partner organization and the young people that I work, and I think the vibrantness of Impulse NGO today has a lot of young minds uh, and young leadership themselves. Uh, in terms of taking it to the next level. What is very core when we talk about women leadership, it's also about looking at what is the proposition of leadership roles that women are having in this sector. It's very sad to say that uh, even in the human rights sector, we're having less women-run organization, we have more male. I'm not saying that that is not uh, the correct way, but I think looking at it from a gender balance approach that how Impulse has formulated in the way we approach Impulse model is very necessary because uh, we need to encourage more women leadership in this sector uh, when it comes to social issues and even the for-profit sector. But there has to be a co-balance. Here, I would say the government has a lot to do. Uh, and overall, of course, um, social conditioning has a lot to do. But when there's a huge force from the government, social conditioning changes. Then women are being able you know, to aspire and the platform are much more uh, conducive and much more uh, easier in terms of entering. Because sometimes women leadership are always uh, you know, a problem when there is a cultural hindrance when you look at an overall as a country, not just from the Northeast as such. Uh, where do you see, uh, you know, in context uh, to the Northeastern part of India and in, you know, and in other regions also, uh, uh, one of the major challenges for a non-profit is to raise funds and to finance and you know, financially sustain their, your organization. Uh, your suggestions on you know, how a newbie should go ahead in terms of ensuring financial discipline as well as fundraising and sustainability for a non-profit? So if you're talking about fundraising, it's an ongoing 
uh, challenge that many non-profit in the country, even in Southeast Asia, and even globally today, because Impulse, after the year 2012, when we got the World Innovation Prize from the Global Development Network under the Japanese Most Innovative Development Project, we were asked to scale to Myanmar for seven years, going eight years now, and then Nepal and Bangladesh. The experience is the same. Sustainability in the nonprofit is very similar because many non-profit organizations are driven by projects. And sometime in today's world, we are seeing that the project is driving the social entrepreneurship sector in the, in the social you know, I mean, issues, which sometimes can be, uh, it takes away the core innovation or the work that one has to do. So there has to be a thick balance on that. My own personal journey and experiences is that one has to be uh, able to comply with non-negotiable term when it comes to shifting your focus. So we as an organization was very strict that we were not driven by project and donors. We were driven by innovation and the needs and the uh, methodology of the application of that needs uh, in terms of a successful model allowed us to be more stronger to negotiate donors that they have to see things in a win-win lenses. So that's very important for somebody who wants to start a non-profit organization because sometimes you can be driven from one topic to the 10 topic in a course of one year and you lose focus from the actual social intervention that one wants to do or originally started. So one has to have a fine-tuned balance on that. It is not a very easy task, but if you have a hybrid model, uh, it also helps in terms of sustaining a non-profit like the way we are doing because the livelihood, the profit, 60% of the profit goes back into the non-profit. So it gives a kind of a strength uh, to balance the fact that even if there is a, uh, you know, a dry up of donors, you have money coming from the community, reinvesting back at the community. So that's a very good, uh, what we call it, focus that one has to look when you're starting a non-profit. A large number of our viewers are, you know, are aspirants of uh various public services. What defines public service according to you? Public service to me is that um, every individual who are in a public service is also a change maker. Their participation in a collective leadership, like what we experience under the impulse model, uh, can also bring more social change. And public service is just not about you know, bureaucratic exercises, but public service is also about engaging uh, a balanced bureaucratic comes development focus, which is very right based, so that there is a holistic uh, move of change in the country that they can play a role. So for me, public service is an important element that you could be in a public service and be a strong leader change maker who participate and collectively make these changes to take place, not just from the policy point of view, but move the policy around the need so that there's a higher growth and, you know, in the exercise that one wants to have. Thank you, Asina, for taking your time out and sharing your insights on various uh, you know, areas of social development and social work. Friends, this was Hasina Karbi, who shared their journey with us. We hope that you have this interview इंसाइटफुल और एडुकेटिव लगा टीम इन करने के लिए धन्यवाद एंड माय बेस्ट विशेस टू स्टडी आईक्यू एंड ऑल द व्यूवर्स